worked with Dr. Barrett for over a year on the Diamond Knoll project will be interested in the results of his extensive study of the artifacts recovered at the site. According to Barrett, a clearer understanding of the region's prehistoric importance has been reached through the Diamond Knoll project, largely due to the partnership developed between TxDOT, Coastal Environments, and the Houston Archaeological Society. In his presentation, Barrett proposes to show a network of indigenous footpaths and trade trails to explain the presence of exotic material culture in Southeast Texas. Barrett has provided an excellent handout to accompany this uh, presentation that you can find on the HAS website if you haven't already pulled it up. Uh, Jason received his PhD from Texas A&M University in 2004, joining the TxDOT Environmental Affairs Division's Archaeological Studies branch the following year. For TxDOT, he is currently the managing archaeologist for the data recovery excavations at Frost Town in Houston, as well as principal investigator at Diamond Knoll. He also recently directed the Texas Archaeological Society's annual field school for three consecutive years and later served as the society's president. Jason also volunteers as a professional advisor to the Houston Archaeological Society, which we will miss terribly. He has authored numerous journal articles, book chapters, and technical research reports, and has taught courses in archaeology and cultural anthropology at A&M, Baylor, Rice, and Blinn College. Jason has lived in Texas since 1995 and in Houston since 2012, but will be moving to Toronto, Canada in April, 2021. Jason Barrett. Hi everyone. Uh, thank you for so many people um, coming or showing up for this. And a lot of you have, have uh, worked on the Diamond Knoll project, showing up to the screening site or been part of lab processing, worked on the artifacts. Some of you were, were even at the site. Um, like Rich is at the site quite often. Um, so this is a presentation of sort of the state of what we know right now. The Diamond Knoll project is in its writing phase. A lot of the analysis is done, but there's still more that we're that we're doing. I'll, I'll talk about that near the end. Um, this is largely an analysis uh, that has um, come out of my study of the projectile points and it focuses mainly on, on the dark points right now. Most of you know, for those that don't, Diamond Knoll is a site in Northwest Harris County and TxDOT discovered this as part of the environmental, uh, environmental work that we did in preparation for the Grand Parkway, the third large loop circling Houston, making it look like a large bullseye. And what you're seeing here is, uh, well, the middle picture on the bottom is the site surrounded by the, the orange fencing. You can see the right of way completely targeted the site. Most of the sites that we encounter, we catch a portion of it in the, in the right of way. Most of it lies outside of the right of way. This one is completely within the right of way. So uh, we, we get to excavate a, the entire, well, most of the site, much more than many of the sites that we go to data recovery with. What we found is that there, there are a number of strata um, that are fairly easy to discern in, in most areas. Some areas have uh, a lot of pit features. Some of those pit features are um, for cooking. Others turned out to be burials. And there are others that we haven't identified a purpose for and gopher runs. It's pretty common in Southeast Texas for sites to have poor stratigraphy. A lot of them are fairly sandy, um, but we also have a lot of critters here. We have a lot of gophers, we have a lot of crayfish, bugs and various other things, armadillo that like to burrow in the ground and they can really screw up an archeological site pretty well. Well, at Diamond Knoll, they had more crawfish than anything else. And, and so what we see is in some areas of the site, particularly where the uh, deposits are thicker as you go south on the site, we, we have decent stratigraphy. There are pits, of course, that um, are dug from one level down into another and, and that'll mess things up. But where there aren't pits, we have a decent ordering of, um, of dates, which you can see. And those dates go back uh, fairly regularly until about the, um, the middle archaic period. 
At that point, we have sort of an unconformity, an erosional event perhaps, but we have a very compressed um, level at the very bottom that contains a lot of Paleo-Indian material, but also a lot of early archaic material. And um, if, if pits or other features have intruded into it, then you get even younger material. We, we excavated an extraordinary amount of, uh, extraordinary amount of dirt here, uh, 105 cubic meters of hand excavation. But then we also stripped off, in fact, and you can see in this photograph, the very dark soil lens at the bottom is the, what we call the paleosol. And that's what had a lot of the older material in it, which is fairly rare in this, in this area to find a stratified deposit with, with early archaic or, or, or paleo-Indian material. So after we excavated the substantial portion of the site, we stripped off the remaining um, upper sandy uh, mantle to get down to the lower material easier. So all that material that we stripped off, we took to an offsite area. And for a year, uh, I screened that with the volunteers from the Houston Archaeological Society and all across really, the Houston area. Um, there were various universities and schools that helped out. And um, we were visited by the Army Corps, the Texas Historical Commission. Um, people um, really lent a hand and, and, and made it uh, kind of an event for a full year. So we wound up going through another 275 cubic meters of, that, of those strip sediments. So we have an extraordinary artifact collection from this site. How large is it? Well, we have well over a thousand projectile points. Some of them are broken bits and tips and, and bases and things like that, but we also have about 800 pieces that are, that are diagnostic, which is an extraordinary number. Um, if the, the total number of projectile points you probably have represented by even the broken pieces or the unidentifiable pieces, probably closer to 2,000 which is an extraordinary number. But even for what we have here, if you can look at this, this chart and you compare Diamond Knoll to other sites in the area, um, prolific sites in the area, we have by far more projectile points that have been found at, at any other site. However, we also excavated more material. Um, so it's, it's worth looking at um, whether or not we have more because we excavated more. So when you compare Diamond Knoll to other sites uh, in terms of, well, one, the site has a long occupation history, about 11,000 years are represented from the Paleo-Indian period all the way through the late prehistoric um, or the, the, the woodland period. So if you look at how Diamond Knoll breaks down in terms of how many points we have versus how many years the site was occupied or revisited, the amount of time that it represents rather, uh, it, it falls a little bit lower on the list. You have sites like um, HR 273, which have half the amount of um, projectile points found, but it also represents only 1300 years as opposed to 11,500 years. So the density per year is, is much, much higher. And if you look at Diamond Knoll compared to other sites in terms of um, excavated points per cubic meter excavated, then we fall a lot further down on the list. We found quite a lot more there because we excavated a lot more. But how much of a, of a relative difference does that, does that really make? Well, if you do a, you throw a trend line um, across these sites, anything to the right of the trend line exceeds expectations and anything to the left of the trend line um, falls under expectations. Only Diamond Knoll, um, LB2, HR 273, these sites exceed their expectations, Diamond Knoll more than any of the others. So there's actually a fall off. Though it's not like you, you find a certain amount of material um, and that stays, stays a constant rate no matter how much you excavate the site. Typically, we excavate the main area of site, which is where material is the densest, and then you have a fall off as you go further away from that main area. So excavating more doesn't always mean that you're going to come up with a lot more. And that's why you have this trend line showing that even sites that 
have a lot for the amount excavated, um, they can still fall under this line. Diamond Knoll clearly has more material there than you'd expect, even for the amount of, um, of uh, material that we, we excavated. What we have is over 75 unique dart and arrow types represented at, at Diamond Hole. And that is an extraordinary diversity of artifacts. I can't think of another site that has that many types represented at it. So it begs the question, why is it that we have such diversity at Diamond Hole? And you know, we have um, planes types, like, um, like a Hell Gap in, in Agate Basin. But you'd expect that in, in the in the Paleo-Indian period because most early paleo materials tend to be derived from the plains. So we also have a lot of central Texas types. We have a lot of types from the east, east of the, um, the Texas border into the, the lower Mississippi Valley and quite a few from the um, upper Mississippi Valley and Ohio River Valleys, but we'll get into that in a minute. So this is just a list of all the different types that we have represented. And this isn't all diamond knoll, by the way. You can see that some of these are highlighted like in a blue type rather than a white type. In order to have as many, um, a, as large a sample as possible to do the type analysis, the Fort Bend Archaeological Society loaned me artifacts from, uh, from their collection from uh, Smithers Lake, which were, were collected over the course of, I think, 40 years by a, a game warden. So they're all from, from the lake, and I had to clean a lot of lake off of them um, for the analysis. But anyway, so you have the ones that are in blue here are only at Smithers Lake. They weren't actually at Diamond Hole. They still represent uh, types that are present in Southeast Texas. From the analysis, a few new types, I've been able to identify a few new types. Now we have Motley's here. And Motley's are well known, particularly from Louisiana, Arkansas, um, Alabama. And those are the two on the left. We have Godleys, which are very common in the Tr Trinity River Valley. And they're a smaller type. They're made a lot, they can look a little bit like a Motley and you can confuse them if you're just looking at the Turner and Hester book or a lot of the other references that we look at. Godleys, almost 90% of them are made, the, the stem is made by um, kind of an overlapping bevel. They're, they're um, they're bilaterally beveled. So you'll have, and you can see it on the second goblet, the one furthest to the right, where you have these flakes coming to make the stem that sort of overlap. You don't see that in Motley, and you don't see that really in, in any other style. It's very unique to Godly. It makes them very, very easy to, um, to identify. And then you have this type to the um, far left. I call it a darrow because it's um, sort of halfway between an arrow and a dart. It looks like a large Alba arrow point but it's very large. It's, it's definitely a dart point. And while it does look like godly, when you have, and there are like 850 um, specimens in the, the, um, in the study that I did, and over 40 godlies and, and many darrows. So looking, when you have that many specimens and, and you can really see the variability within any one, it becomes a lot easier to pull out differences. So if I only had the godly and the darrow that you saw from the, the last slide, you can see that, that the new type, the darrow, could fall within the variability of a godly. But when you have many other examples of it, you see that the points on the right are not the same at all as the ones on the left. They are a lot different. In fact, the stems aren't made the same way. They're not made with the, um, the beveling that you see on the godlies. There are um, a few other new types. One, uh, I don't like the Gary series. Everything in, in Southeast Texas, really in East Texas, tends to be thrown into either Gary or Kent. And the reason for that is we have kind of poor raw material. And you can, you can see where um, forms kind of blend into one another. That's true for Central Texas as well. You can get Williams and Marcus's and Castorville's that will blend into one another with the variability within each. And those in the Marcus can blend into 
Enzer and Ellis, it's only in Southeast or only in East Texas really that you have everything just lumped into Gary or Kent. And I think it's a lazy approach to it. So a few people have looked at the Gary's and pulled those out into what they call varieties. But I think really the more types and you have Gary is more of a series that really just means contracting stem. Uh, so what I've used for more of a type name, I used uh, Johnson's 1962 uh, work on the Yarbrough and Miller sites where he pulled out nine different types of, of Gary. I can't make all of his work. Uh, maybe I just don't have them represented. At, um, in his work, the, this projectile point on the left would fall under a Hobson in Schombach's work um, for the lower Mississippi Valley. He calls that a uh, Gary variety Gary. Then you have the next one, which is what um, what Johnson would call a variety Gary and what Schombach is calling a LaFleur. So you have sort of contrasting styles or, or names that are used to define anything in this Gary series. And last I knew, Zach Selden was, was looking at Gary's and hopefully he's going to come up with something that um, sort of synthesizes what people have, have written in the past and, and gives a, a decent way to sort of analyze them. Um, you also have at Diamond Knowles many of these. Um, I'm calling them a Teton. It's a small little, uh, they're smaller than a Darl, and they have a very, um, very straight sides and a very rounded base. They're small, they're, they're, um, they're they come very late in the in the uh, chronological sequence. And there seems to be some evidence at Diamond Nolan, and, and hopefully I can write this into the final report, where you have not just adoption of the bow and arrow, um, but adoption of the bow in sort of making the arrows that, uh, making the dart types that, that people are making at the time just smaller until eventually people just adopt scalerns and albas and bonhams and catahoulas. They make true arrow points. Uh, which had to be a lot easier than um, making darts just smaller. The one at the end here, Bodkin, is probably one of the ugliest one. Um, we have a, several of them that look just like this. And in fact, the first person to identify these as a type um, was um, uh, Jelks, Ed Jelks at the same Sam Rayborn Reservoir. He had a number of these. He called them type Z. He didn't have enough to really formally uh, name it, but it's a very, it's a very expediently made form um, off a of flake, and it's side notched, and it's very ugly, and has a very, very low use life because it's uh, it's made to just be very expedient, so it it can't be resharpened very often. This represents uh, what we have of the Gary series. So if you look at something at one end, something at the other, something at the top, something at the bottom and in the middle, you wouldn't necessarily call those the same type. They're not the same thing. But if you line them up from one end to the next, you can see how they sort of bleed into one another. And that has a lot to do with the very poor quality shirts we have in this area in the, in the petrified woods. It doesn't mean that these are all Gary's. It just means that it's hard to tell the difference between one type and the next. So you have to sort of know what they're trying to make. And it helps to have a site like Diamond Knoll where you have 40 specimens of one thing or 30 of another rather than just one or two, which makes it very hard to tell the difference between one thing and the next because you only get a small uh, sampling of the variability. The size of this collection has also lent clarity to some existing types. One of the types in this area that has uh, been sort of misidentified a lot from its, I mean, the Wells Point first identified at um, Poverty Point, I believe, and believed to date to the early archaic period. And from how they're made, in other words, the flaking pattern on a, on a Wells and the amount of uh, attention paid to, to grinding and polishing the stem, they're very much an early archaic form. But you have these other forms, um, Kaufman as part of the Gary series, Dawson, Emery, 
uh, as part of the Gary series and Runge as part of the Gary series that are often called wells. The problem is that um, the Dawson is an, a late archaic style and the Kaufman, Emery, and Runge are, are uh, woodland styles. So you'll find reports where wells are dated to the late archaic period or the early woodland period. And they're not, they're an early archaic point form. They're just misidentified a lot. An example is, here's an example. You have um, the points on the, on the left are either from Diamond Knoll or Smithers Lake. If it's a number like 2304-001, it's Diamond Knoll that has an SL in front of it, it's Smithers Lake. So a good assortment of wells from, um, from those two sites. And then on the right-hand side, you have specimens that are reported to be wells from a 41MA27, and not one of them is. The ones in the bottom are so curated, I wouldn't, I wouldn't even try to type the ones on the bottom. All the ones in the middle are Dawson's, and all the ones on the top look like Runge styles. Um, none of these are Gary's, but they're reported as Gary, and because, well, Dawson's are a late archaic point type and, and the Runge are, are woodland type, you're gonna have wells from late archaic and, and woodland contexts. Wells is one of the, the most, um, it, it's pretty well defined, but it is misidentified almost as often as anything else in, in, in East Texas and Southeast Texas. And how something is made is important. Our, our reference guides just aren't enough. Um, they don't really teach us how to identify differences from one thing to the next. We have an extraordinary number of, of, of straight stemmed or close to straight stemmed projectile point types in, in Southeast Texas. We do get some Bulverde, but mostly in the, in the Western half of, of Southeast Texas. So really um, they tend to hang out more around the Colorado and, and Brazos River areas rather than the Trinity and the Natchez. Um, Morils, which are really poorly defined and uh, very hard to identify. You have Carrollton's, which are fairly easy to identify. I mean, they look like Christmas trees in a sense or, or pointing arrows. Uh, they're they're a, a very easy type to identify. You have poncha trains, which are, I think, underreported. They're very, most uh, descriptions of poncha train don't include the uh, medial ridge that they often have, which is a, a pretty diagnostic feature of them. And we have a ton of them in, in Southeast Texas. It's the Louisiana influence that, that we have all through this area, um, which is why we had pottery in this area 1500 years before Central Texas did. We have um, a very small number of marshals in this area that they're not as common. This, this um, provisional group five that I have, I think might be a marshal that's just been uh, really curated. So it's important to know how a, a point type is made because you have to know what it does through curation in order to really, um, really identify it. Um, Delhi's from, again, from Louisiana, we have um, a number of those. Kent's, Kent's are actually really, for a poorly made type, they're pretty standardized. Um, Elam is an interesting point type. Uh, Christopher Ringstaff is gonna do an experimental study looking at how elims are made to see what kind of variability exists um, within the type. I think really elim is defined more by a technological approach than it is any kind of formal morphology. You have emeries, uh, which are just slightly tapering and kind of have a rounded corners in the base. Uh, a new type, Colfax, which is somewhat like an em uh, emery, but has a very, very narrow stem. And uh, Darl's, of course, and, and then the new Darrow. Axtell versus Palmias. Palmias is very, um, very poorly defined. I remember um, at the annual meeting in San Antonio, uh, Hester, Tom Hester told me, no one really knows what the hell those are. Well, one of the reasons is they were defined in the 1950s by Scotty McNeish in Northern Mexico. And when Sum and Jelks put their uh, first volume together, they needed a name for these sort of rounded base, um, bulbous based forms all throughout East Texas. 
and they looked a little bit like what McNeish was calling a palmius. So they used the word palmius. It's not the same point type. Um, the palmius, and Elton Pruitt explained this to me, the palmius really is what we call um, a Hidalgo now in, um, in, in South Texas. The palmius of East Texas or Southeast Texas is not the same as the type specimens that McNeish named. And then Harry Schaefer in uh, the 1960s did a survey of um, the San Gabriel um, River and he defined a second, second form of palmius, which isn't a palmius. The palmius, as you can see, and, and here's an example, uh, the palmius of the ones that are on the right-hand side and the one in the lower right corner of that graphic is what a palmius looks like when it's fairly new. It is made on a teardrop preform, and you can see the difference in the in the in the sort of black graphic I have here between an Axtell, a Williams, and a palmius. Axtells are very long, almost lanceolate forms, and they tend to keep that length in their blade as they get resharpened. So you very as they get smaller and smaller with resharpening, it's not uncommon to find a medial ridge down the center because that's not getting recycled um, or that's not being reduced to the same extent that the edges are. So you'll have a thickening of the center comparatively to the edges, even as it gets shorter. But with palmius, you have these small little, little um, um, barbs that oftentimes get broken off. And the base breaks, a, straight across a lot of times. You can see so many of these, these examples that have a broken base. So very oftentimes, you'll almost never find a full palmius. You find examples that look like um, all these others that are, that are heavily recycled. Well, how can you tell the difference between that and, and an Axtell that's been recycled heavily? Well, you have to know what the form was. With the palmius, the notching kind of curves in towards the center, very much like a Williams, but since they're a smaller form, form the final notching flakes shoot towards the center of the piece, like up and towards the body, versus an axe tail, which is a larger form. It's usually trimmed from the side, so you don't have those final flakes that kind of shoot towards the upper body. You have them like shoot across the stem. And so knowing what the form was, um, maybe look like and how it was made can help you identify even heavily curated pieces correctly as being either an Axtell or a Palmius. Tents are odd. You can see the standardization in them. Um, for a form that was actually fairly poorly made, the bases are very square and, and like across the board, they are just about the same width and the same length. Tents are very odd in in so much as they have a, a, a weird bent variety, the bent kent. I think these are just kents that were used as, um, as uh, knives rather than arrows. They just look really funny. Maybe they're just shooting around trees to get something cutting on the other side. You also have forms that um, people say, well, they're not here. You don't have Snyders, or you don't have a Finney Snyders here. And in fact, many of the Snyders, which are the ones that are represented on the right hand side, I've seen reports identified as Marcuses. Marcuses are much larger. You can see those in the upper left. And they are um, notched from the base and then straight kind of into the center, as opposed to the, the Will, um, Williams, which curves in towards the center. So um, you have kind of a triangle form for the base as opposed to like a football form, which the Williams has. It's very different than um, both the Ellis, which is on the bottom left, and the Snyders, which is on the right, which are corner notch pieces. The difference in the Ellis being it starts out as a triangular preform, and the, um, the Snyders starts out as kind of a teardrop preform will give you the difference in what they ultimately look like. But you have to accept that maybe we have some things that aren't normally in Texas in order to recognize them when they're here. So we've used um, both projectile point forms that are represented and environmental markers and um, a, 
number of other things you'll see on the next slide, to sort of redefine the uh, phases of Southeast Texas prehistory. We've got basically two phases of the, of the Paleo-Indian, the early and the late, an archaic one and two, a middle archaic one and two, a late archaic one and two, and then a woodland period. And we use Mossy Grove to define sort of stages or intervals within it. Deanne's story first, uh, first ex um, proposed Mossy Grove as being, uh, as defining this area. And it's sort of a nebulous meaning. And um, what Mossy Grove basically means is um, sort of Appalachian woodland. You know, it's, it's, it's woodland, but yeah, they don't have everything. Kind of a bayou version of woodland. Some of the things we use in order to define our periods are presence and absence of bison, um, climatic intervals and um, major changes such as the cooling event at 8.2 thousand being the end of earlier K1, um, the sudden arrival of bison at about 6,000 years ago and the, um, and the associated arrival of, of uh, Bell and Andes points being the start of the middle archaic period. So we used a, a number of, of, of different um, cultural and, and natural um, background uh, um, data to, to define our periods. The, the Paleo-Indian period is defined, uh, again, mostly in the early part by, uh, by types in the plains. And you get a lot of Central Texas types like um, the Berkeley or the St. Mary's Hall, Angostura, starting in, in the later, um, the late Paleo-Indian. In the early Archaic, you, ha um, you have a lot of uh, Eastern types like Lost Lake, Big Sandy, Palmer, St. Charles. Those are all Mississippi Valley points that show up in the early Archaic. And then the least represented in the archaeological record period at all in, um, in Southeast Texas is the early archaic two, which goes from about 8,002 to about 6,000 years ago. We have almost nothing in this area that dates to that. We have a lot of Buckeye points, which were, were dated about 7,000 years to about 7,000 years ago um, from the Buckeye Knoll site in Pretoria County. Um, and I've put Martindale and Gower here as being sort of the markers of that period but we have almost no Martindale or Gower in Southeast Texas. So this is, this is a great unknown, what, what's happening in that 2,200 year period. Then with the, uh, the middle archaic, it starts with the arrival of bison and you have Bell and Andes points, and then you have a lot of central Texas forms, Travis's um, in the very Western part of the, of the, of Southeast Texas, you have a box and, um, you get some Yantis and a lot, some earlier, actually quite a lot of the early archaic, I mean, early triangular, some Nolan, a lot of wells. And then in the middle archaic two, you have um, more regional, regional styles first start to appear, particularly those that are associated with the Trinity River Valley. You have um, Morals and Carrolltons um, from further east, you have Evans. And you still do have a lot of Central Texas type, you have Bolverde, you have Pedinalis. Then starting with, um, coinciding with the arrival of bison in the start of Poverty Point about 3,700 years ago, you have quite a lot of, of Eastern styles show up. You have Etleys, you have Table Rocks, you have um, Evans is still here. And, uh, in the late Archaic two, you have Adena, which is Ohio River Valley. You have Sinner, which is um, really more Louisiana, Arkansas. Um, but I think they're much more represented in East Texas than, uh, than is commonly believed, only because Sinner is generally identified by very recycled specimens. And I think we've identified what a Sinner actually is before it gets heavily recycled um, from the Diamond Oil Collection. So how do you determine if a piece is really exotic? Well, um, I took all the specimens that have identified as Adena, which almost 
looked to be, you could say, yeah, that, that could be Central Texas chert, and fluoresce them. And they fluoresce a deep blood red, very much like um, an Arkansas nevaculite. They do not fluoresce the kind of bright orangey um, yellow that a Central Texas chert fluoresces. So it tells me I'm on the right path, perhaps. But fluorescence is a good primary, uh, preliminary check. Um, it's not the be all end all because there are some Central Texas chert Central Texas chirts or chirts from any other place in, che in Texas that don't fluoresce at all, or other areas of the country, you can have a, a chert fluoresce very similarly as the Central Texas forms do. So it's a it's a good start. What we really need is a multi-regional raw material type collection. That would be helpful. Chemical characterization of chert studies have had very limited and almost really no success. Chemical characterization is good when you have something like obsidian where you have uh, a very small number of impurities, um, and those impurities tend to be diagnostic. Chirts pick up a lot of impurities from the surrounding soils uh, that they form in or the surrounding rock that they form in. And so the differences between any one outcrop can obscure differences between, um, between outcrops. Um, so chemical characterization studies on chert have been uh, pretty unsuccessful. So the point forms that we have, where do they actually come from? A lot of Ohio River Valley, a lot of Mississippi River Valley, um, and even some forms from, um, from West Texas. We have quite a number of, of, of projectile points that only really look like the Figueroa type that's been defined in, in West Texas. So how did they get here? Well, I relied on um, work by others to look at uh, the distribution of these trails that have been mapped for many areas other than Texas. Uh, native trails in the eastern United States and southeast um, and even in the Midwest have been mapped um, to a much greater extent than they have in Texas. Uh, we even have more trails, say, mapped in Louisiana and Oklahoma than we do in Texas, and the Spanish mapped many in the western United States. So in terms of Native American trails, Texas is sort of a black hole. But I, I've been able to put some of that back together by looking at um, GLO maps from the General Land Office, um, particularly for northeast Texas and east Texas. Many of them um, include Native traces, Cherokee trace, the Kickapoo Trace, but we also have Spanish accounts um, from the early uh, exploratory period and during during the mission inspections of the Crusade inspections, they wrote that they were following native trace action to not build new roads at the time, only to follow native traces, and so they had native guides to do that. And it makes a lot of sense in a way. Natives have been living here for thousands of years. They knew how to avoid swamps, they knew how to avoid alligators, they knew where to find water. So blazing a new trail was dangerous. Following an existing path was smart. So many of the, the many of the what later became roadways, early colonial roadways, started out as Native American footpaths. But what we're really interested in here is how um, why it is that when Poverty Point comes um, comes to fruition in about 3,700 years ago, you suddenly have all this lower Mississippi Valley stuff show up in Dunn Knoll. So this map illustrates where those two are, and you can see that there are network linkages in these native trails. A poverty Point is a weird looking site. It's, um, has this mound A off to the, off to the uh, west, and then it has these half concentric circles. And in another present, presentation for Texas Archaeology Month, I go into uh, kind of a theory of what the form of the site represents, but I just want to talk about the aisles right here, because the aisles, those things that split the concentric circles, have never really been looked at. So I started wondering what they could possibly be. And so I mapped out, I mean, as I'm, as I'm looking at native trails, and I know the importance of river crossings, and many of these river crossings are the same ones map, uh, marked on map after map for 150 to 200 years. They're 
they're the standard place to cross a river. If you think about the Colorado River, there are very few places you can cross it, but you can cross it at McKinney Bluffs. There's a, there's a nice limestone shelf over it. So that was a common, um, that was a common crossing of that river. And many large river systems had these common crossings based on um, just natural attributes at that position that allowed it to be easily crossed. So I mapped out major crossings and, and showed those in red and uh, minor crossings shown those in green. And then I kind of superimposed the Poverty Point site and, and did a declination for where those aisles go. And they all point to major river crossings. Here is a 1823 uh, map of Louisiana showing Poverty Point river crossings. And if you take those um, aisles and you extrapolate from where they are, they cross right over where, they, um, where the river crossings are. Now, Northern Louisiana is not Chaco Canyon. I don't think you actually had like straight roads heading to the crossing. I think it was more symbolic or maybe it was a means of wayfinding from Poverty Point that um, you sort of aimed for the stars that the alignment was pointing towards. I think you didn't take a straight road to get where, you, where you're going. There were enough bayous and rivers there that, that would have been impossible. Here's a 1847 map of the United States and Mexico. Um, again, showing the major river crossings, Poverty Point with the aisles, extrapolating where those go right through the major river crossings. So Poverty Point, in my mind, is a logistical base camp where groups came through many of these overland trails from um, the Ohio River Valley, from Tennessee, from Alabama, Mississippi, Florida, gathering at this point and probably proceeded into Texas or into Oklahoma to hunt bison because they do correlate with the arrival of bison in this area. You see the major river crossings here. The, uh, the northernmost uh, aisle points the Arkansas River Crossing, um, Red River Crossing, so two crossings of the Sabine, and then um, the, the southern aisle points to uh, the Mississippi River Crossing at, at Natchez, which also links up to the Natchez Trace. This isn't a radical position, really, or shouldn't be by any means. Uh, major overland networks have already been mapped out for the western United States. Most of these um, were mapped out fairly early by the Spanish. And the green dots that you, you see on that graphic show these rendezvous points where um, multiple tribes would get together for the purpose of ceremony, and trade, and communal hunting. Hopewell culture, you also see uh, all, the, all the materials that come in from all across the United States coppers from Michigan, silver from Canada, um, shark's teeth from, from the East Coast, uh, mica from the Appalachian um, Mountains, and, and uh, shells from, from the Gulf Coast, also galena from Texas and, and Arkansas. So these were all being drawn into the Ohio River Valley by the whole boat culture in the sphere of trade influence. Um, the most... Uh, um, Grant Hall and most recently Gus Costa have looked at uh, trade, trade spares in Texas. Grant uh, looked at the distribution of boat stones um, and made out of uh, Arkansas materials um, and where they distributed in Oklahoma, Louisiana, Texas. He also looked at the distribution of corn and tank knives made of Central Texas chert. And you can see how far those flow north. Um, Gus looked at banner stones and um, None of the, well, some of the ones that he, he looked at probably come from Texas raw materials, but a lot of them come from Alabama um, or Arkansas or areas well outside of Texas. And not surprisingly, they show up where um, the um, Arkansas River in Oklahoma is or really um, where this trade trail comes right through Harris County which turned out to be the art later that would be called the um, the Atasca Cedar Road. So one of the things that uh, occurred to me is, well, 
most of these native trails were mapped out in the historic period, you know, the, the late 1700s, early 1800s. How do we know that they weren't um, made more recently around then? And, and how do we know that they have any, any significance for the woodland period or the late archaic or even the middle archaic period? Well, I mapped out woodland period mound sites and some, I think some of these are archaic mound sites. Um, and then overlaid the trail system that, that uh, Meyer developed in 1928 or, or documented in, in 1928. And if these were older trails that were only developed in the 1800s, why would they so routinely go right through archeological sites that were developed 400 years prior? These trails are ancient. They were used over and over again. They became many of the roadways. The Atascacita Road is I-10 now. They became many of the roadways that we use today. Um, some of them are well documented, like the Natchez Trace that um, goes through Alabama and, and links into um, uh, uh, Louisiana. And, uh, that's even a, a national roadway now. But many of them we don't account for in, in how these materials moved vast differences, uh, vast distances rather. And we can look at what some of the early um, Spaniards wrote at, uh, at the time um, that they were exploring Texas in the 1500s and the, and the 1600s. The diaries of governors um, de Leon and Tehran Salinas confirmed that old Indian trade routes connected East Texas Tejas groups and associated Caddo Indians with Central Texas tribe, tribal allies, as well as with uh, allied tribes from south of the Rio Grande in West Texas. Um, at LaGrange, which is uh, at, the, at the time was called Buena Vista de Leon, documented a local guide fluent in several native languages. Why is a guide going to know several languages from groups separated by hundreds of miles, if not for trade, if not for regular interaction with those groups? So this long distance trade predates the horse. And it probably accounts for the amount of um, exotic raw material that we have at, at archaeological sites in Southeast Texas. The, the, um, the graphic on the left, the black dots represent long duration sites, sites that um, were, uh, that have everything from Paleo Indian through late prehistoric. So they have 11 to 12,000 years of, of prehistory documented at that site. And you can see how many of those fall on or along uh, Native American trails. Several of them were along the Padai Trace um, that uh, Doug Wilson has worked at, or, or at least looked at the materials for um, in the Andy Cobb collection. And then several right along Cypress Creek, which is uh, where Diamond Knoll is. The other red dot on the upper, upper right-hand graphic, the lower red dot is where the Smithers Lake is, um, which doesn't fall necessarily on a, on a trail that I've I've been able to document through GLO maps, but is not saying that it isn't there. Um, historic maps can help out a lot in showing you where um, uh, the importance of these 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 trace these trails. The Diesel map of um, I'm probably pronouncing that wrong of 1718 is horrible in terms of geography, but what it does show you is that these native um, villages clustered right along trails also along river systems, but really mostly where trails and, and, and river systems kind of connected. And so these trail systems were important for um, finding archeological sites of where they would be. Um, the Stephen Austin map is, is slightly better, but um, again, it shows you the strong association of, of trails with um, Native American villages. There are other maps um, that are variously useful um, showing where, where these old roadways or trails um, are located. What's important to look at with these old maps is realize that cartographers like to draw a straight line. What, uh, on the, um, these, in these two graphics, the one on the right shows a reconstructed uh, map of the actual Caminos de Rales, the San Antonio Road, the La Bahia Road, um, they zigzagged quite a lot 
versus um, the map on the on the left hand side, which is kind of how you more often see these standardized on on these old maps, um, like the Mitchell uh, 1835 map. They they don't really get all the zigzags in there, so the trails are approximate rather than than um, an exact representation of of what they actually were. More accurate are the GLO maps, but only a small percentage of these um, really document where, where native trails were. This is a good one, the, the Nacogdoches 1839 map, which not only um, identifies a few uh, uh, native villages, but it also shows old trace, cattle trace, road to the cross um Indian trace, Cherokee trail, um, Cherokee road, where the old San Antonio road is. So there will be some GLO maps that will have um, old native traces documented. The, the Grimes County map on the, on the right-hand side shows you know, unidentified trail systems, also the Canard Road, which links into the Cachada Trace, the upper Cachada Trace, and then the La Bahia Road. These were all native traces to begin with, and just later renamed. How can we discover these traces? Well, one way is LIDAR, um, but these all have to be ground truth. So anything that looks like an old uh, wagon road is a viable uh, trail to sort of explore, but many of these may be ATV tracks. So there's a lot of ground truth in that that needs to be done. Trails look like old, you know, old trails look like what you see across the bottom here, these old wagon tracks. Sometimes they 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 gouge deep ruts into the into the terrain, and other times they're they're more ephemeral. We can also look at GPS modeling, uh, GIS modeling, and um, I've used least cost path analysis to um, predict where a trail should be based on terrain conditions and the location of different resources. And the assumption here is that humans are going to choose the easiest distance to get from from point A to point B. But easiest doesn't necessarily mean the best terrain. It can mean it's easy because there's water available, or it can mean that it's you know easy because it um, avoids a swamp that has a lot of alligators in it. Or there are other things that, that can't go into this, like taboo areas. Are they avoiding like an old cemetery? Well, how would we know, particularly if we haven't found the cemetery area? We don't even know what their belief systems are. So would they even avoid that area? Um, so there are some limitations to least cost path analysis, but it's a good model to try to like, at least try to predict where, where, um, where trails might be. And then of course you have to ground truth them. Here are some of the potential um, limitations of, of doing least cost path analysis in GIS. Sorry, I'm not gonna stay on that or really have time to talk about it, but I spend too much time probably talking about projectile points. So here is Jim Abbott and I ran some least cost path analyses and uh, we were looking at the, the black dotted line. We're trying to find the easiest path between Nacogdoches and San Antonio. Well, it, it follows pretty well. It would actually follow the upper Cachada Trace very well had I put the, um, the river crossing at, at Sumter in when we ran this. Um, but even then it, it crosses, after it crosses the Brazos River, it switches from, at that point, the La Bahia Road over to the old San Antonio Road. So that area that I have circled um, might be a good place to look for a trail. I mean, maybe there was, there is some validity to the prediction here that there was a linkage between those two. In another example, I looked at um, going from Beaumont to, um, maybe this is just Liberty, you know, Beaumont to uh, San Felipe to Austin. And that would be the trail, the trace of the, um, or the, the pathway of the, the Atasca Cedar Road, which uh, Diamond Knoll falls on. Well, the black line, it goes from actually Liberty to San Felipe. The black line is predicted path. The red line is where um, the Atasca Cedar Road is, is um, mapped on. And you can see that as it approaches Diamond Knoll and Grand Parkway, it veers well to the north of what the predicted path is. Now, what would be the reason for that? Why would it do something like that?
that? Well, the circled area is um, is a is Hockley Mound. It's the the largest or the highest elevation in all of Harris County, and it's a site that we know is a gathering area for Native American groups. There are a lot of archaeological sites documented um, at Hockley Mound, um, but really more from the collectors than from the the site form. So. Being that that was such an important gathering place, that would be something that draws human footpaths uh, away from the easiest terrain path onto um, onto another pathway, and then it descends down into San Felipe, Austin, and this red dotted line goes right over Diamond Hill. So, here again is uh, least cost path is the black dotted line showing Tascosito Road. Um, going east-west, and then north-south at Liberty is the La Bahia Road. Um, the green is uh, Cachada Trace. The red are the long-duration sites that have uh, Daily Indian through Lake Prehistoric. And you can see there are a good number that, that line up right along these roads, or right along those paths. Um, I can send you this slide if you really want to know more about least cost path analysis, but I don't uh, want to spend any more time really um, talking about that right now. Um, the summary of the research so far is that Diamond Hole, Diamond Hole exhibits evidence of having been period, periodically revisited for over 11,000 years. The site is situated on an extensive overland network that stretched across the continent. The time depth of the trail system elements remains unclear. To me, I think it goes back at least until the middle archaic period, though. So we're talking about at least 4,000 years and as much as 6,000 years. Dark forms are prolific at the site and reflect varying degrees of um, external influence by period. Regional types developed during the Middle Archaic period starting just after 6,000 years ago. The Late Archaic period begins with the return of bison to the Texas prairies, um, the Southeast Texas prairies. And uh, at that time, Poverty Point also begins uh, in Louisiana, and you have a lot of lower Mississippi Valley um, projectile point forms and material culture come into Southeast Texas at that time. And that's a relationship that sort of continues, uh, and I think it influences the early adoption of ceramics in this area as well. Poverty Point is strategically positioned um, to have function as a logistical base camp facilitating communal bison hunts across the Texas prairies and also uh, into Oklahoma. Um, its architecture may represent a geoglyph referencing, referencing this function. And again, my, uh, if you go to the, the THC YouTube page, I have uh, my Texas Archaeology Month presentation is similar to this. It talks less specifically about the point types in, in Southeast Texas, but it does talk more about Poverty Point and it goes into this geoglyph idea. There are so many people to thank for this. Right now, um, I'm doing a, a write-up on, on the um, projectile points. I'm also uh, doing a chapter on, on reconstructing trade trails. Chris Ringstaff is going to do a, a, um, an experimental study that I mentioned earlier on um, focusing on Elam points. Jen Anderson is studying use life histories on some of, of, the, um, art, of the, the stone artifacts we have. Eric Oxanen in, um, has, is going to uh, study the, the bifaces and, and write a chapter on that. Jim Abbott helped out with the geoarchaeology, uh, as did Charles Frederick did the most of it, did most of it. And um, Brittany Gregory is, is, is helping the project a lot right now. Not only did she work and field at Diamond Knoll, but now she's helping sort of reconcile some of the profile drawings and um, to make sure that the report is as accurate as it can be. Uh, Rich Weinstein has been my, my co-PI from the, from the star. Erin Phillips came into the project late, but she's been uh, instrumental in, in doing the ceramic analysis of the, of the, from this site, and uh, we'll be writing a chapter on that. John Loos, uh, when he worked with Coastal Environments, would um, really put this project on track and um, managed it very well. I'm glad he's coming back now to help with the, the research design that we hope to submit for the THC soon and um, also writing a chapter on the dating, various dating methods that we've, that we've um, reviewed. Roger Moore uh, 
was the project archaeologist on the site and he actually discovered the site uh, in the 19, uh, 1980s, I believe, or it was the 1980s. Um, Kate Spradley, Laura Springs, and uh, Christina Figueroa Soto helped out when we discovered burials. Uh, they came out and um, identified those and also helped when we uh, stripped the sediments from the site to make sure that we weren't disturbing burials. And then the Houston Archaeological Society worked with me for an entire year screening mounds and mounds and mounds of dirt. And they, they pulled in um, other volunteers from Oh, the Texas Historical Commission uh, volunteers came down for a group event that we did with the Houston Museum of Natural Science, but the Brazos, Brazosport um, Archaeological Society, Fort Bend Archaeological Society um, groups had people volunteer every weekend. Um, we, we had students come up from Rose Hill Christian Academy and St. Thomas University, Lone Star College and Houston Community College to get experience not necessarily with field work, but like it's useful to learn how to identify artifacts, and we can do that um, just from the screening site. So we were able to give students um, a taste of archaeology in a sense. Um, I'm really indebted to the work that the Houston Archaeological Society has done and continues to do on the site for me, and um, I've, I'm really thankful for the, the good working relationship I've had with coastal environments for uh, but nine years now, or going on nine years. And for uh, all the interest that uh, the archaeological community throughout the state has had in this project, um, I hope to honor that by producing just a phenomenal report on, um, on one of the best sites, I think, that's been excavated in Southeast Texas. And with that, I will stop sharing my screen. Thank you, Jason. That was incredible. Thank you so much. Oh, can I can I open it for questions? Uh, Jason, Johnny Pollard, uh, did you happen to, when you started the ceramic analysis, note a movement of technology from the east to Diamond Knoll? At, uh, in uh, terms? Go uh, ahead. Is Rich Weinstein still on? Yeah, I'm here. Rich is the most qualified person to answer okay. that one. Uh, when uh, we we specifically looked for evidence of Chifuncta and uh, ceramics coming in from Louisiana from the east, but I don't think we found any. Uh, I think we have we found some, a couple. We we don't have any Chifuncta, do we? No, we didn't. But we had. No. Some things that were like um, uh, we have some things that we thought might be eight and talks about uh, Goose Creek variety Anahuac, which is early, early Goose Creek, virtually the same as Jefuncta variety Mandeville, uh, coming in at around coming into the Galveston Bay area around 200 BC or thereabouts. We might have a couple of shards of Anahuac, but uh, not quite sure yet. There was something I think that looked Coleman in size or something like that. Well, we yeah we did have we did have some weird uh, grog tempered stuff that was curvilinear. It looked like Coleman, except the paste was a little different. And Coleman is a, a is a incised variety uh, dating mostly to uh, Plaquemine culture, so AD 1250 to 15 1600 in the Lower Mississippi Valley. Um, but I'm not sure it's the real Coleman. It's, it's something similar, but so no, we didn't have anything definite real early. Eagles Ridge, uh, over on Lake Charlotte, uh, east, just east of the Trinity has some good early Chifuncta material, good early material, uh, good early Goose Creek like stuff. That would probably be one of the best sites for, uh, for early material. Okay, I, another question, <clears throat> yeah, I guess more toward Aaron. Uh, we're working on some ceramics from Big Creek going through uh, to the Brazos. And uh, a number of our shirts are very, very smooth exterior and interior. And they are what we are starting to call floated. The surfaces were floated. They weren't scraped, rubbed, burnished or whatever. And uh, what was, 
did you have examples of that from Diamond Knoll? Yes, we did. Smile at me, not gonna <laughs> say more. Okay. Yeah, yeah, we we did. We had we had some examples of stuff that was floated. Um, and one of the interesting things is that I learned from um, Chase Earls, who's a Caddo Potter, is that um, on occasion you have things that are like floated and then burnished. And um, so floating doesn't have to be like exclusively, you know, a standalone. Um, you can have burnishing on floating, but there, there were a number of things that we saw that like um, were floated, but I couldn't see evidence of burnishing on top of it. Yes, that's what we've been seeing on the Big Creek, a lot of it. And I don't know exactly what that means. Is is that a special pot or is it just a technique that people were using in that area at the time? I think it's mostly just a technique that was being used in the area. Interesting. Thanks, Johnny. Anybody else have questions for Jason before he moves to Canada? Quick, quick. John Lowe's had his, has his hand up. Yeah, thank you. I'll lower my hand so that uh, I get called on again. I've got a couple questions. Um, thanks for that uh, talk, Jason. I think it's super great to see so many um, influences and uh, sort of the um, evaluation of, of key kind of contextualizing factors like climate, environment, um, bison coming and going, you know, in particular to help make sense of some Southeast Texas uh, patterns. Uh, I appreciate the global view, and I think the study is going to add uh, immeasurably to what we know about archaeology in this area. Um, of course, we all know that uh, the bison coming and going are probably the most important factor to consider for prehistory. I'm just kidding, because that's my own bias, of course. Um, the bent Kent knives, they look a whole lot like Cody knives. Um, you know, you show wells is kind of overlapping with uh, Calf Creek. And I think from a plains perspective, you know, we, we sort of we don't have a broad enough view of, of the different kinds of types that are associated with bison, especially during Calf Creek times. Um, what can you tell us about um, bison occurrence in good context at Diamond Knoll, or is that something that's uh, just fixing to be figured out or, or going to be nailed down with some of this future work? Um, you know, for example, are these bent Kent knives, are they found with bison uh, either here or anywhere? Do you have wells points with bison during this Calf Creek interval? Um, or do you have, you know, Calf Creek uh, con context um, uh, there at Diamond Knoll uh, at all? Um, and do you have, when you say uh, sort of that later cake begins with bison coming back in, can you tell us a little bit about what that looks like? And so that's a lot of questions, of course. Um, they're all kind of around bison. What do we know about the bison chronology at the site? Um, so we do have bison at the site. We, we have uh, bison that was very definitively found in uh, what, what we what you call the, the Toya phase of the late prehistoric, right? Very late in prehistoric period. Sure, yeah. Uh, and we have bison that was actually found at, at much deeper depth, but we weren't successful in, in dating that. Uh, a, lot of the, a lot of the bone that we dated turned out not to have enough collagen preserved. Um, so we, a, a block of material that we, um, that we date, uh, a, a much smaller percentage of that actually came back with a date. Um, we're finding the same thing right now, actually, with um, trying to date botanicals. So Diamond Knoll isn't going to be able to, like, give you uh, very good bison dates, I don't think. We, um, there is a lot of material that came off, and uh, a lot of bison bone that was uh, recovered from the scrape material, but I think that's going to be, since it was in the upper deposits, it's, it's probably, yeah, yeah it's going to be late. Um, and uh, some of it might be late archaic, but it's more likely than not going to be late later in the pre. It's going to be late woodland. Um, in terms of Calf Creek, we have uh, a lot of bell points, and we have a number of andice points. I think at least three. It might be four. Um, so we we have a very definitive Calf Creek um, projectile point component. And we have bison um, that's fairly well down in the um, stratigraphic profile that doesn't have enough collagen to date. Yeah. In terms of um, the association of, of um, where those uh, that calf-free component 
material culture is with the um, with the, the bison. I haven't looked at that yet, actually. So that'd be something to to look at. I, I have the data. Um, I can pull that up for you. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think this this I'm small apartment behind your house. If you're looking for where I am, so I've been watching your light go on and off up there, so I, I know where to find it. <laughs> <laughs> For those that don't know, um, the house that I was renting uh, sprung, I think the final total was 11 um, leaks in the ceiling, where it's 60-year-old uh, galvanized pipes didn't make it to freeze. And so I think it was just uh, the weekend before last when um, I, I haunted Linda and Bob's dreams by having them look at more shell than they ever want to look at again. <laughs> Uh, it was like that day that the water was finally turned back on and but mercifully john gave me a place to stay in his little treehouse apartment behind his house yeah <laughs> we're happy to have you there's, there's my dog away from his chickens <laughs> Doug, um, you have anyway, hair, no, Doug. i can look at least positionally where those things are if they're they're um in association with, with one another i haven't actually gotten to that that step yet okay thank you Deb, you have your hand up. Yes, I just want to say not so much a question, but I just want to um, thank Jason for his association with the HAS for all these years. I don't know how many times I used him as a sounding board for ideas off of types of projectile points. And in my mind, it was one of the best uh, working relationships between professional uh, archaeology and an avocational society. So I know this is kind of your swan song, and I just want you to know that we are all incredibly grateful for all you've given to us, and you will be missed greatly, my friend. I That's appreciate the truth. Yeah. Virtual oh, applause. Yes. Yes. Virtual applause. <laughs> I, I could be giving this talk from Toronto right now, and you all wouldn't know. I'm not. <laughs> I'm not unreachable when I move. I just, just throwing that out there. But thank you so much, Dub. I really appreciate it. Just take your damn shells with you, okay? <laughs> uh, and John, did you have your hand up? No, they're, they're Rita's shells. Rita can have them all back. I know. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I meant to put my hand down. I'm done. Okay. Anybody else have any questions for Jason? I saw John's tail up though for a second there. <laughs> <laughs> We got cats and dogs running around, so there's all kinds of critters here on this. <laughs> I do want to say, following on to Dubs, we really have had a very special relationship with with Jason and, and his wife Jenny, and um, he's and it's going to make me cry. I apologize, but he's the same age as my my daughters, and so we he he calls me mom, and I call him son. And it, it, it's just been the most wonderful few years getting to know Jason. So we're going to miss you so much. But with Facebook and with Zoom, we hope you stay with us, young man. We love you. Uh, you're going to make me like load Facebook back onto my phone. Just get rid of that. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, anybody else have any qu other questions for Jason or comments? Well, you you now have Brittany to take Jason's place, so uh, you can. I'm infinitely not as cool as Jason. It's okay. <laughs> I'll second that. Do you do you I'm drive not, an Audi TT or whatever that thing is called? Not nearly as cool as Jason is. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, well, we've had a we had a run. we have a wonderful turnout tonight. I I know we had about sixty people on the yeah. Zoom meeting and more on the YouTube feed, so. Thank you all so much for being here. And um, unless anybody has anything else to say, we'll see you next month. Um, unless we go over to Jason's and count more shells, which we will be doing. So stay tuned. You'll hear from me.